Yate, Shio, hello, and welcome to the second presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series. The Indigenous Education Institute, IEI, along with the National Parks and Bureau of Land Management, is proud and honored to present A Sense of Place, Indigenous Perspectives of Land and Sky. Our second speaker of the series is Kaiu Kumura, Executive Director of the Imi Loa Astronomy Center, Hilo, Hawaii, who will be speaking today. My name is Nancy Maryboy, and I'm the founding president of the Indigenous Education Institute. We are a nonprofit institution with an all Indigenous board and staff that has been in existence for 25 years. We are located in the San Juan Islands, Washington, and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve protect and apply traditional indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on native education, environmental change, and sustainable healthy environments on earth, water, and skies. Much of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. I would like to begin our series today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the world. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, we are honoring indigenous peoples around the world. The presentations in these series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional thinking. In native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other disciplines, we will be presenting worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. I want to personally thank you for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have almost 500 people registered today from all across the United States. I would now like to talk, turn over the mic to my colleague, Marcia. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Zoom. I'm Marcia Deshadnay, the manager of San Juan Islands National Monument. The leading purpose for this monument's designation as it's defined in law, is for the protection, conservation, and restoration of Coast Salish resources and cultural properties. The BLM works with 12 coastal Coast Salish tribes locally to fulfill that purpose. While across the nation, federal land managers are working on similar complex challenges at all levels. One of our objectives for this speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful working relationships. Collaboration with integrity. Dr. Little Bear's presentation last month detailed the metaphysics of science, the age of reason, and that the strength of scientific thought is in context with its culture. Kaiyu Kimura has taken the next step, integrating that concept in to the design and management of a renowned educational institution, again, serving the needs of communities of place and communities of interest. Following her presentation, we'll pose some of the questions that you asked at registration. There will not be a live question and answer session. However, the closing screen for this webinar is a page with contact information for each of the partners, and you're welcome to reach out to us individually, including Ms. Kimura. So make note of your questions and ask them later. This and all Sense of Place presentations are recorded and can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly following the events. As you registered by email, we'll also send you notices for upcoming presentations. Thanks for joining us. Nancy? Oh, am I muted? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, it is my great pleasure now to introduce our guest speaker, Kaiu Kamura. Kaiu is a native Hawaiian who lives in Hilo, Hawaii. 
She is the executive director of the world-renowned Imaloa Astronomy Center, which is part of the University of Hawaii, Hilo, on the Big Island of Hawaii. She has been with the organization for 19 years. Kaiu is a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools and received her bachelor's degree in Hawaiian Studies at UH Hilo. She received her master's degree in Hawaiian Language and Literature at UH Hilo, spending a semester at the University of Waikato in Hamilton, New Zealand, studying Maori language and culture. Kaiu works tirelessly on behalf of Hawaiian language and cultural revitalization. Her work is centered around her Hawaiian community and building relationships with the Western astronomers who work on Mauna Kea. She has developed a language curriculum which is now being offered to Hawaii's business community. Kaia was the principal investigator or director of IWISE, Indigenous Worldviews in Informal Science Education an NSF-funded project that brought together indigenous grassroots communities with federal funders and policymakers. I had the honor of being her co-PI for the project, and I know firsthand how dedicated and hardworking she is. She is also an avid paddler and was given the honor of being selected to be a member of the Hokulea Long Distance Voyaging Canoe Crew, which recently completed an all around the world voyage without the use of modern navigational instruments. Caillou sailed on the, um, on the Okinawa to Japan leg of the 2007 voyage to Micronesia and Japan. Her cultural heritage, life experiences, and educational background provide the perfect background to help guide the Imaloa Astronomy Center as it moves forward, providing a holistic view of traditional Hawaiian star navigation and today's astronomy findings. As a native Hawaiian woman with deep family and community roots in Mauna Kea and director of a museum which features Western astronomy, she is an exemplary leader who can provide balance and direction as we move into the future. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Kaiu Kimura. Aloha nui kakou, mai ka aina, i kaulana, i kaua, nana, i lu, i nga lihili, i kaulana, o mo kaulele. Ai na one, o na aina o iwi, mai oa o o kahonua ni. Aloha nui a kakoa pau. Uh, greetings to each and every one of you. Um, thank you, it's a great honor to be with you here today. Uh, and it's always a great honor to be uh, reconnected with my friend, sister, mentor, um, Nancy. Thank you for um, inviting me to be a part of this speaker series. I'm, I'm very honored, uh, especially um, knowing who you have lined up for this uh, series. And I also uh, want to thank the BLM, the National Park Services, and of course, Indigenous Education Institute, um, for allowing me the opportunity, just opportunity to simply just share a story. Um, my story, our community story, uh, Imi Loa's story with all of you. So mahalo ho um, no kia, launa pu ana o kapo. I am um, going to share with you just some images uh, as we go through um, today's discussion. So, Mauna Kea, Kuahiwi Kuhao Ikamalie, Mauna Kea, the tallest mountain in the world from the bottom of the ocean floor to its summit peak, um, which stands tall and alone in the calm. I grew up on the beautiful slopes of Mauna Kea, a place of native Hawaiian ancestral connection. This is the place where the pico or the umbilical cords of my ancestors, of my own, and of our generations, our younger generations are buried. An ancestral Hawaiian practice that grounds and affirms our familial connection to Mauna Kea as a place of origin for our family and for our lahui or our people, our Hawaiian people as a whole. It is because of this connection uh, to Mauna Kea that I do what I do today. I am the executive director, like Nancy um, and Marsha mentioned, of the Imilua Astronomy Center of Hawaii, 
whose mission is to honor Mauna Kea by inspiring exploration that's grounded in Hawaiian connections and worldview, together with modern astronomical and scientific inquiry writ large being done on Mauna Kea in ways that engage and benefit our local communities, and in particular, this younger generation represented in this picture. Imi Loa is a part of the University of Hawaii at Hilo, where we, by design, embrace a spectrum of knowing which expands our understanding of the universe and the relationships therein. Imi Loa is about honoring Mauna Kea in all its dimensions, promoting the value of seeing the world through a different lens in order to enhance and better understand um, worldviews. Our immersive planetarium programs, interactive exhibits, educational programs and services and products have now reached over 1.5 million people from both local and global audiences, ranging from keiki, like you see um, in this image, or, or youth, to kupuna, or our elders. The name um, Imi Loa itself actually comes from this quote here, Ahu Kupanaha Yahawai'i Imi Loa, which was expressed by an early Hawaiian scholar um, by the name of Kepelino. He was a historian of the mid 19th century who meticulously recorded in Hawaiian, Hawaiian historical and cultural knowledge. The word Imi Loa refers to both the pursuit of new knowledge as well as the one who pursues the knowledge, the explorer. A core Hawaiian value, Imi Loa, is about venturing into the unknown, bringing back new knowledge, and sharing discoveries with one's people. Ahu Kupanaha Yahawai'i Imi Loa translates literally to mean beautiful and astonishing is the profound wisdom embedded here in Hawaii. Many from throughout the world come to seek this profound knowledge, which we felt this reference was appropriate to name and call forth this center to honor this longstanding Hawaiian legacy of deep, far-reaching exploration that empowers our lahui or our community. I apologize for the graininess of this image. I could not find a better one on my home computer where I'm at right now. But we felt uh, also that Imi Loa was an appropriate name given the fact that many from throughout the world come to Hawaii to study the universe through astronomical observatories that now reside atop Mauna Kea. Arguably, Mauna Kea is one of the best, if not the best, place on Earth, and I recognize that's debatable, um, to view and connect the universe from. So in 2001, we embarked on the journey to build and develop the center. For the first time since the development of astronomy on Mauna Kea, which began in the 1950s, Native Hawaiian community members, astronomy community members, came together to co-create a space with a shared vision of providing educational opportunities with and for our community, engaging youth in the potential for science and culture collaborations. I, I participated in Imi Loa from its very inception um, in an attempt to bring about collaboration between the indigenous and scientific communities. But in all honesty, it was hardly a collaborative effort. There were, and there still remain many, many challenges to this work. Developing a space for interdisciplinary exchange was and is not easy, especially given the controversial history of astronomy's development on Mauna Kea. Like I referenced earlier in the 1950s, um, the university pursued, the University of Hawaii pursued uh, the development of astronomical observatories on Mauna Kea to advance its research mission, its scientific inquiry mission. But that mission came without much deliberation, conversation, and engagement with a community who connects ancestrally to their genealogy and of, of their family as well as of the universe, um, which is Mauna Kea. So, a lot of issues, long-standing historical issues, were shouldered upon those that were charged to build this center um, as we engaged in our work. We endured great struggle 
uh, and great conflict as two distinct worldviews, Hawaiian worldview, modern astronomy worldview, literally collided uh, in the development of Imiloa, resulting in a bifurcated experience of cultural displays on the brown carpet, like this image displays, uh, and astronomy displays on the blue carpet. At that time, uh, in the early 2000s, we were more concerned about getting equal real estate in Imiloa than we were about talking about the, collab the connections and the diversions of, of our worldviews. We could not agree on the content that needed to fill the exhibition, 12,000 square feet of exhibition space. As part of the Hawaiian research team, we had wanted to focus on the story of our people, the resiliency of our people and the ingenuity of our people within historical context and within modern context. The astro our astronomy counterparts wanted to focus on science and discovery as a general um, and healthy endeavor for a community. Both good, but not in alignment or in agreement at the time. Some ex tangible examples is Kumulipo. Kumulipo is one of our Hawaiian creation um, records that's over 2,000 lines long, codified in a chant that's orally um, transmitted. Kumulipo starts from the very beginning of time when there is nothing but deep, dark, fathomless power. And within that power, creation begins to establish the um, elements that create our universe today. Humans don't come in until about 500, the last 500 lines of this chant of the Kumulipo, which really indicates that our ancestors intuitively and through observation understood the establishment of our universe, of our world, and that humans are relatively new to the story of life within the universe. Uh, it ends with um, the birth of a very famed and um, powerful chief uh, who happens to be a Hawaii Island chief, um, who his legacy um, unified the islands here in Hawaii. But that's an example of celebrating and honoring the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom of our kupuna. And yet when displayed or discussed with, you know, sort of the mainstream scientific perspective, it wasn't good enough because it, it's not something that is provable or it wasn't um, equal to uh, theories like the Big Bang in terms of the origins of the universe. So we had great contention there uh, in discussions. Another point is the use of Hawaiian language. So as the Hawaiian content team, we were committed to making a center that was bilingual, that would live and, and exhibit through our Hawaiian language for those who speak Hawaiian and are looking for other environments to engage with their families, with their friends in the Hawaiian language, and to also share with those who aren't familiar with the Hawaiian language an experience that truly reflects Hawaii's culture and language. That was a big debate because it would extend prolonged timelines and expand budgets in order to accommodate two languages. Hawaiian content was also, I think at the time, um, seen as something that would be beautiful decor on the walls and the lay greeter that would welcome you into the center up front, but not necessarily um, something that had true scientific value or substance that could be displayed side by side with modern um, astronomical endeavors. So it was very challenging. All that to say that it was a very, very challenging conversation. I'd come to work and have to debate with colleagues about um, the validity uh, and the, the, the place for our Hawaiian language within Iniloa. And then I'd have to go home uh, and socialize and hang out with family and friends who were also very concerned and some adamantly against my participation in building the educational center because of the, the controversy of an astronomical development on Mauna Kea. But you see, for me, the drivers were very clear as to why I was involved in this project. The drivers that engaged me, kept me engaged in the challenging times and continue to keep me engaged is creating space for Native Hawaiian stakeholdership in processes. You know, I grew up in Waimea, uh, which is a small town here on Hawaii Island that has two major astronomical observatory headquarters located in our very small town. 
Um, and growing up, it was very strange to see these two big buildings and see people go in and out, but not really know who they were or have a connection to them. Because in a small town, especially in Hawaii, and I would venture to say everywhere, you know everybody. You're either family or good friends. Uh, you see each other at the grocery stores. You go to each other's parties, each other's homes, and you're, you're a community. Uh, but we didn't have that same kind of connection with the observatories at the time um, when I was growing up. So it was always interesting to me, and I had always wanted to understand better who, who, what these endeavors were in my own hometown. So Native Hawaiian stakeholdership means being at the table, helping to either uh, drive the table or drive the table as it relates to decision making and processes of places that are near and dear and places that ground us to our cultural identity. Additionally, I had wanted to participate to create and further ensure spaces where our olelo or our language and our culture thrive and reclaim once again, a place of normalcy in Hawaii, where it's no longer novel to olelo or to speak our Hawaiian language, where it's no, no, no longer novel to understand cultural nuances as it relates to our relationship with each other and with the land. I also understood that developing an education center would provide big opportunities for our local youth. And so wanting to remain engaged so that we um, had a seat at the table and were actively um, being a conduit with the community, with the university, with the astronomical community, astronomical community to garner the best opportunities that we can for our youth. And last but not least, I saw this as an opportunity to bring community together around difficult issues to bring about resolution uh, driven by the values and aspirations of our community. Integrating and including a Hawaiian perspective and approach, not just for the sake of in in inclusivity or equity, but to truly enhance the science and inquiry itself. Bring about new understanding and implications for Hawaiian, Hawaiians, and Hawaii as a whole um, as advancement through um, a global endeavor such as astronomy. These are the things that initially drove me and again continue to be the same drivers for me today as I um, am still at Imilo. <laughs> you know, as difficult as these conversations were in the beginning and regardless of this juxtaposition of worldviews evidenced in this image that seems so disparate, the simple decision to have the conversation under one roof open the door for much more, for dialogue between the two, our Hawaiian and astronomy communities, for deeper collaboration and co-creation by simply sharing space in a single location. So to me, this was yeah, as, as rocky and as challenging as it was in the beginning, it was a critical, important first step for us to start to come together and build relationships and get to know one another. Um, so, and as, as I apologize, one specific, I think, um, or, or one, yeah, tangible example that helped to bring our conversations or our build relationships between, in the case of Imilo, our Hawaiian and astronomy colleagues, was the commitment to the Hawaiian language bilingualism of the center. Although not supported initially, eventually it became um, a priority and a commitment of the center's leadership. Um, this commitment by, to simply have two languages displayed in the center, I, I think opened new conversations because we now had to sit down together and talk about things like quasars or black holes or arterial disks, <laughs> things that we didn't have in our Hawaiian vernacular, um, but when explained the concepts um, of these scientific discoveries and or processes of discovery, um, it really helped us to understand astronomy at a, at a different level. And then it, it afforded the opportunity for us to dive deep into our own Hawaiian language and our own Hawaiian um, historical knowledge to, to draw upon and make um, correlations between the astronomy 
knowledge set and understanding and our own. And by being forced to create language that would then talk about these concepts or these objects or these discoveries in our language, um, it was a great practice that forced our conversations to better understand where each other was coming from and really get to some deep, deep diving conversations. So I, I attribute um, Emilo's ability to bring our teams together around language and around having to speak our own unique languages, but find a way to communicate our perspective in each other's languages. Um, fast forwarding, so we opened in 2006 um, and since then, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to say that some of my staunch um, family members and friends who were very much opposed to my participation in, in Imiloa are now some of the biggest supporters of the work that Imiloa does and the impact that it's having on community. Um, so I wanted to pull forth one example of an effort that we've launched through Imiloa. Um, one of many, but this is a newer, but I think substantial um, initiative that continues to build off of this spirit of collaboration um, and understanding one another's language um, to create a shared understanding. So before I do, I want to give you a little bit of background into what Ahua Hei Inoa, on the name of this initiative, where it, where it actually came from. Um, the idea, an idea was brought to my attention by one of our Hawaiian community members, a leader in his own right in many respects, um, who thought about, you know, hey, if all these major discoveries are being made off of our mountain, then we should honor that in a Hawaiian way and have our own community be able to engage in these discoveries in a way that um, helps us to contribute to scientific dis uh, advancement, but also in a way that grounds it to our Hawaiian understanding. So he simply said, could you, we should be naming everything for every major thing maybe coming off of, uh, out of these observatories in our Hawaiian language. And we should have our kids um, be a part of that process to expose and engage them in that scientific inquiry and to allow that to be a vehicle that allows them to also dig back deeper into our own knowledge uh, and wisdom so okay it was a, it was a great idea and you know shortly after he brought that idea to my attention this naming opportunity surfaced um, in october of 2017 uh, an interstellar asteroid discovered, uh, entered our solar system, discovered first on Haleakala, which is on the island of Maui, and then followed up uh, in research from observatories on, the Mauna Kea, on Mauna Kea. Um, I received a phone call from this person here. Again, I apologize for the pixelated image. His name is Doug Simons, and he is the director of one of the telescopes on Mauna Kea, um, who very anxiously and excitedly talked about this opportunity of naming an object that had never been before, never before been discovered. Um, and to astronomy's knowledge, had never um, observed an interstellar object coming through our, our solar system. So he gave me, I think, like 72 hours to create a name for this unique, unusual object that he knew would have far-reaching uh, impact across the globe because of the unique nature of it. So I uh, went to visit this person. This is Larry Kimura. Uh, full disclosure, we have the same last name because he's my uncle, uh, my father's brother, um, who happens to be, uh, he's dedicated his life to the renormalization of our Hawaiian language. Um, his passion, love, and driver is that our Hawaiian language become renormalized again, one, once again here in Hawaii. Um, and he's currently a professor at the University of Hawaii at Hilo in Hawaiian and Indigenous language studies um, and has really spearheaded a movement to bring our language back. Uh, so I called him to ask him if he would come up with a name for this object that was um, literally hurling through our solar system. And I gave him 72 hours, which is a challenging time frame, especially if you know us here in Hawaii, sometimes we like to think and pray and eat and socialize an idea before it becomes solidified. But he came up with a name, um, and the name of this object is now Oumuamua. 
Um, you may have heard of it in the news. It literally went viral um, over, you know, within I think a, a week's time or two weeks time, there are over 14 billion hits on Google for Oumuamua. And many of the hits for Oumuamua weren't necessarily talking about the object itself, but talking about the uniqueness of the name, which translated, translated into English means the, um, a scout or someone or something sent in advance to, to do some recon or to understand or, or to connect um, in new spheres. So Oumuamua, which I thought was not going to be a popular one because it's long and somewhat challenging to pronounce, um, was immediately accepted by the science teams and I think on the global um, stage as well. Efforts, um, Efforts were already underway to create this process uh, to suggest Hawaiian names for Hawaii born astronomical discoveries. And the opportunity to name this um, interstellar object um, helped us to test um, our interest and our desires. And I think given its, its big hit uh, globally, we realized that this is something that we um, need to contribute, uh, continue to do, and that is bring Hawaiian knowledge and by extension indigenous knowledge together with um, astronomical pursuit to further raise the awareness and engagement of our indigenous communities globally. Uh, with Oumuamua we realized that there is great value and richness that's derived from this exchange and the co-exploration of these discoveries. We gained a profound understanding, again, of each other's knowledge and that resulted, I think, in, in the deeper appreciation um, that helped to broaden our perspective. I would have probably, if not engaged in the process, thought, oh, what's the big idea about a big rock coming through our solar system? Aren't there like billions of them out there? But in learning about the process to discover and then the unique properties and opportunities that this you know, first time object offered, I think it was a, it was exciting to be able to engage in it in a Hawaiian way. Um, so we formalized our efforts, we created a working group and we started to expand this initiative. Um, and in, a year later in October of 2018, we convened our first cohort of youth, Hawaiian speaking youth from throughout our state who came together at Imi Loa to look at other discoveries and engage with the scientific understanding of these discoveries as well as understand or learn more and deepen their understanding of Hawaiian um, knowledge as it relates to our universe and our origins. And um, I won't speak any further because I want to share with you a video that I think speaks for itself in terms of what we, we experienced um, back in 2018. Whether in a classroom, at the kitchen table, or mingling with friends. The Hawaiian language is once again being heard here in Hawaii. As Hawaii's only bilingual informal science center, Imiloa is a beacon of the continued relevance and capacity of the Hawaiian language, even to the science of astronomy and the names given to celestial bodies. Larry Kimura brings a wealth of knowledge to this process of kapa'i noa, or the art of creating Hawaiian names, even to new discoveries like this extraordinary asteroid 
that otherwise would have simply been known as One Eye 2017 U1. And so the Ahua Hei Noa initiative was born, bringing together Hawaiian language students with Olalo Hawaii experts and astronomers to learn this art of kapainoa while naming two new discoveries. A ole vau i mana o mua kahi kike a akui inoa mo ke kahi mea makalava ole ke kahi mea e lahai maona aina e ai a i hiki ke haku i mana ko no no bei ke kahi ao ao o i hana ke pono e haku inoa pono pu e ao a mo popo he ai e mea e kapa i hana. Bring your arms in. Out. What do you guys notice when he brings his arms in? It goes faster, right? And so that's the concept of angular momentum. After two days of learning and creating, the participants unveiled the two new Inoa Hawaii. Kamo'o Alava refers to the fact that the object is a piece of a larger asteroid that broke off like an offspring or mo'o that will now lava or orbit on its own in our solar system. The second object is orbiting near Ka'avela or Jupiter, but it's almost mischievously going in the opposite direction of Ka'avela. Given that Epa is a word for mischievous, the asteroid was named Ka'epo Ka'avela. Ano ka poe kilo hoku a oka oka honua a ale pa ma a itano ano o e hana pu me ka poe o iwi imia e haku ia ina inua aka ina noia aina ia mau kau na na ana he me a nui ka hiki ke ho ano i te matin kahi ilo a mai ai ke ia mau mea no leila ke ia ano papahana e like me ahu a he inua he ke ihi na ho ke ia e imi uh, the students involved in Ahua Hei Inoa and us adults alike stretched our minds and imaginations, um, gaining an appreciation of Hawaiian culture in relationship to the universe and an understanding of the unlimited potential for future fusions of culture and science. These students helped us make history and learn that their voices are not only important, but necessary. One of the students uh, in reflection of the experience told me that, wow, for the first time he connected what the stars above us and the objects above us that are being discovered, how our ancestors in old records and, and um, uh, bodies of knowledge recorded their understanding of that as well. And he felt very honored to be able to reconnect with that. We'll also learn about how we're seeing those, um, those same things today using modern technology. You know, despite the social um, political tensions around the future, de uh, future development plans for astronomy on Mauna Kea, which we are currently in a very contentious time with the proposal of building um, yet another telescope, the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea. Despite all of that pressure and all of that tension that um, has really hit our community, these students engaged and they weren't afraid to engage. 
So we liken them to the first, um, the first canoe, or the brave visionaries that dared to venture into uncharted territory, making way for others to follow in their wake. They weren't afraid to engage with knowledge systems that seemed foreign to their own, and in the process learned that it just is another way of looking at what, his, at what their ancestors inherently knew and recorded in our bodies of information. They witness that we can rely on ancestral traditions to carry us forward and hold how bold initiatives can truly change and shape the way in which we see and understand the world. These are some of the students that we took them up and um, had them understand how discoveries are captured through the observatories. And for many of them, that was the very first time that they had um, been in an observatory, uh, met people who work in an observatory and, and learned about the process of how scientific inquiry is done as it relates to astronomy. Their two names that they created, Kamo'o Aleva and Ka'epa'u Ka'abela, have now been formally adopted by the International Astronomical Union, which is the international body that formally um, approves and catalogs astronomical discovery. We hope that this is something that will continue to be practiced in terms of astronomical nomenclature, um, deepening roots here in Hawaii while propelling Hawaii's Hawaiian worldview onto the global scientific stage. Uh, this was the closing ceremony for that initial get together. Um, and since then, um, we've named uh, many other major discoveries like the first black hole, Pobehi, um, we have two more names coming out, which I can't tell you because they're embargoed at the moment. The scientific teams have yet to um, publish their scientific papers. But when they do Hawaiian knowledge, Hawaiian names are, um, will be put forth yet again. Ahua Heinoa um, creates pathways in which a meaningful partnership between our language and our culture and scientific advancement together um, are helping to shape the core of modern scientific practice here in Hawaii. We're creating space where science and culture coalesce, where culture makes science inquiry and education relevant to the community um, which it exists in, and where new and improved um, discussions, new and improved bodies of knowledge, new and improved solutions perhaps becomes possible. Um, in closing, I, I just, I want to share right, that inherent um, to Emilio's function and purpose is being an arbitrator. Uh, and this is commentary that we've received from um, surveying and understanding where our community um, feels Emilio is, what we're doing, what we're not doing, and where they hope to see Emilio do better in. And it's been very um, strong feedback that our local community, again, despite the challenges with the management of Mauna Kea and with the further proposed plans to develop um, more ast astronomical observatories on Mauna Kea, it's clear that our community wants Imilua to be an arbitrator, to be a place, a convener, uh, to be a place that brings together various stakeholders in an effort to foster understanding and to keep lines of communication accessible and open. Imilua was designed to integrate a Hawaiian worldview and modern scientific inquiry through educational opportunities. The Hawaiian worldview has a very holistic approach that starts from the context of place, culture, people, language. On this foundation, Imiwa embraces multiple ways of knowing in the belief that inclusion and diversity, though grounded to the sense of place here in Hawaii, strengthens our understanding of the world and our relationships therein. We are at a very critical time um, globally where I think we need to lean on native intelligence to strengthen modern science. Partici part, uh, partnerships like Ahua Heinoa uh, perpetuates our knowledge, again, while engaging with the scientific community, bringing our olelo and our cultural practice to the forefront of Mauna Kea, keeping the history of our mountain and our culture alive, while also bringing deeper cultural meaning to the scientific progress um, that has been made in recent years. As I mentioned earlier, this is not an easy process by any means. Uh, and there are many struggles and challenges facing our community. Um, but we as a community, our own community, need to take ownership, leadership, um, and bring about resolution, which requires being open to different perspectives and allowing for a platform for healthy discussion to take place. 
now more than ever, unwavering unity has become key to our collective success and survival. The challenges we face in the wake of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the ongoing social political challenges of inclusion are compelling us to cultivate and lean into stronger, more meaningful relationships to shape our new normal. These moments of crisis are creating opportunities to collaborate and problem solve, something that started to manifest for us here at home in Hawaii, even pre-COVID around the struggle atop Mauna Kea. Cultivating discussions and collaborations of integrity are necessary in order to address these critical issues and hopefully result in strengthened pilina or relationships and alignment whereby all stakeholders see themselves connected to the narrative going forward. So thank you for, um, for just listening to my story. Um, and I will pause now and, um, and, and answer any questions that you may have. Hey. Hi. Thank you so much for that inspiring story. And it's so amazing to um, really, really wonderful to see what you've done with the communities over there. Um, thank you so much for pulling that together for us, for our audience, uh, and for sharing your expertise. Um, so we have some questions, and these were posed by folks uh, when they were registering to listen to you. If you're ready, I'll just start. Uh, what would you say is the most challenging element to managing relationships with the various communities and bureaucracies of interest for Iniloa? Um, hmm. Probably the most, uh, the most challenging is, is really just managing expectations. Um, of, of the bureaucracies, right? So being a part of the University of Hawaii, a state, um, a state of Hawaii system, there are those bureaucracies and processes that need to happen. And, um, and, that, and that, that's challenging, but not insurmountable. I think the challenges when you have um, different stakeholders coming to the table with very deeply entrenched um, perspectives and therefore goals and outcomes um, that have been created in silos as opposed to as a collective as it relates to you know um imi loa but also as it relates to the core of why imi loa came to be and again that's about honoring um mauna kea and so the challenges of, of stewarding mauna kea uh in healthy and responsive ways for our community um that's probably the most challenging uh, is helping to break down silos and helping to break down entrenched um, perspectives so that people can come to the table and, and feel safe and feel um, confident to engage in healthy discussion around the, the divisions within our community as it relates to Mauna Kea. So even though, you know, Amy Law is an education center that provides all of these education opportunities um, through exhibits and camps and planetarium and presentations and all those sorts of things, at the core, we're about bringing our community together. So I think key to, um, to the challenge of bringing people to the table a a in, a, in a space that people feel safe and comfortable uh, and confident is relationships. So being able to um, relate, reach out and engage with various stakeholders, even they, if they may be differing from your own opinion and your own views, bringing them all in and creating that space where all can engage together collectively. Um, it's challenging, but it's also very rewarding when it's able to happen in um, productive ways. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, you might have just answered this, but you'll let us know. Uh, was there an aha moment where you recognized where the misunderstanding between cultures could be most successfully addressed? Well, I, so I think um, it, it, referencing back to the beginning where we 
literally were like forced to sit down together to create language so that things could be explained in the Hawaiian language. That was my first aha moment, I think, after five years of, of debate and struggle amongst the Imilo internal team. Um, but that, that process of sitting down, listening, being curious, um, and, and trying to understand where perspectives were coming from, uh, and then having to synthesize it and process it in a way that was um, reflective of our own Hawaiian way of thinking and processing and speaking. That was a big aha moment. And even for the astronomers, um, for them to be able to explain and entertain our questions to make that happen, really opened their eyes based on our line of questioning, how our thinking and processing um, happened to be. Uh, where, where it's at. And so the same thing when I saw that same process happen with students um, in, in the Ahua Heinoa program and their question and their, um, you know, their deep dive into understanding where astronomy is and or where these discoveries are and, and what they are um, and where our Hawaiian knowledge is around concepts like origins and creation. Um, Again, that was another aha moment for me to see the students really thrive and engage in that process. Um, and to see the light, you know, the, the, the inquiry um, excite them uh, and them feeling proud about being able to contribute to scientists, PhD scientists who are doing um, research here in Hawaii. They were, they were very uh, excited by that. So I think in, in settings or in context where you have to just really sit and listen and talk and ask questions and, and engage that way, um, it, it, it results in building relationships. It, it's, it results in better understanding. Too often, we don't invest enough time ahead of projects or you know, things like further development or further scientific inquiry or what have you. Sometimes the bureaucracy processes don't account for or they don't require right it's just a, a checklist of items that needs to be done on a, on a legal list but the relationship building and understanding um that that part of of um discussion unfortunately i don't think is invested enough in um and so i um i'm going off on a tangent right <laughs> But I, I think if there's one thing that I want to emphasize and what I've learned from Emi Law, um, through the work at Emi Law, is the importance of building and connecting um, with community, with people who are of and from a place, who hold connection to place, um, and to, to build, to better understand, build relationships, and. Um, I have high hopes that that helps to um, result in processes where local community, indigenous community, are not just beneficiaries or are not just consulted with, but actually are stakeholders helping to drive things forward. And so um, I think things that we've done at EMI Law, although we've been around for nearly 20 years now, I, I still feel like it's, we've just started our work and there's so much more to do but we've spent so much time trying to invest in on the relationship building um, in order to have everything else flow. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, another, how do integrity and trust figure into your approach to management and your expectations for others? It's everything. <laughs> if there is no integrity and if there is no trust, then there, there shouldn't be progress. Well, however progress is defined. Um, I, I, I think that that is core and key to um, successful outcomes. And so like I mentioned earlier, investing time to build relationships and build trust, it takes time. Um, that is, critical <laughs> to any process. All right. 
Well, you might have just answered this one then. Uh, how can the non-Indigenous communities collaborate with the elders and the knowledge holders? This person would like to learn about best practices for collaborating with tribes to tell their stories on federal land. Um, so starting again with um, building relationships and trust within Native communities. Um, sometimes what's really key to that is, is having somebody from that community who's willing to take you into that community and introduce you to that community to start to build connections. Um, but again, taking that time to build relationships is key. Um, and that, in that process, I think it's really important to listen, um, spend time, um, and really hear, feel, see the values and the aspirations of, of the community um, that you're wishing to engage, engage better with. I don't think here in Hawaii, um, for many, right, it's not necessarily about being Hawaiian by blood, although that is um, the bloodline, right, grounds those with the bloodline here to Hawaii. But in terms of our language and in terms of accessing our knowledge and our worldview, um, I think it's something that for me personally, I hope more who call Hawaii home can embrace and start to live and, and um, help us renormalize um, that perspective. And so I think coming in as somebody who may not be of the indigenous community or the native community, it's, it's about being aware and, and, and being honest and true with, with your intentions of engaging with the community. Um, and then, you know, spending time to build relationship. I, I know I'm hammering that point or I'm being very redundant about that point, but I truly believe that that is um, the important necessary um, requirement, if you will, for engaging with community. I'm thinking that you probably have a lot of experience doing that. And I wonder if you have an example, a story you'd like to share about where you saw the, uh, the local community was successful at reaching out to the indigenous community. Uh, well, did you make, or, yeah, I mean, I think that there are um, many examples in Hawaii where collaboration is happening successfully, whether it's um, in agriculture or um, conservation, or even astronomy through examples that I, I gave today. Um, there are many examples where it's not working well in those particular uh, sectors of our community, but you know, I think where there is a true partnership um, happening where we have Oh gosh, off the top of my head, I'm drawing a major blank. I didn't have enough coffee yet this morning, but um, you know, where we have our, our young students who are who, unlike my generation, they were born with Hawaiian, raised with Hawaiian language being normal and it being sort of their first language, um, who now operate in a different way, who are now taking charge um, of institutions, state institutions here, um, like conservation efforts happening on Mauna Kea, uh, who are leading the charge to bring back our native trees and our native uh, birds that nest only in those particular native trees that are on the brink of extinction. And they are fearless uh, and they are rooted in, um, as a result of the renaissance of our Hawaiian language and our Hawaiian culture, they are, they're amazing. And they're very well educated in, in, um, in the, you know, traditional sense of the Western educational system. And they're drawing off of those two strengths to be true leaders of our community, bringing people along to contribute to efforts that are looking to restore um, our native uh, species, our native being. So I'm very um, excited by what are the young, and I'm not that old, <laughs> I'm only in my 40s, but what the younger generation um, is doing with their. Um, 
with their knowledge. Um, so I, and that's, I'm sorry, that's not a specific, you know, tangible example, but um, I think it's just staying the course and being committed, whether you're a native of, of a native community, meaning being born and, and, and um, you know, raised in a native community or whether you've moved into a native community for whatever reason, um, I think, that, um, and I've lost my train of thought on that, but I think that that's, that's where we all need to work together um, to help keep these communities and the unique values and knowledge that these communities bring to the world. That is where we, we can work together to help preserve and advance that so that it is not lost. You know, Hawaii is so diverse. We're try I mean, so many people from throughout the world come to Hawaii, right? And so we've been impacted by many, many different perspectives, uh, many different peoples, many different worldviews. And yet there is no place else in the world where our Hawaiian language belongs or where our Hawaiian culture and values belong. It's only here. So my call out to everybody is to help no matter where you are right is to help these native and indigenous communities thrive um, in meaningful relevant ways to the community sorry that's another tangent and then i'll just stop there right. <laughs> no these are very rich responses thanks a lot caillou so this is your last question <clears throat> How can someone who does not identify with the tribal heritage best approach speaking with about indigenous practices, history, etc., to the public? For example, social media posts and park programs for the public. When a tribal representative is unable to be present, another example, without having to check in to have post or uh, post program approved or to host. Yeah, yeah, great, because you want to be authentic and real when you represent uh, someone else's culture. Uh, and sometimes that can feel awkward or be awkward. Um, I would go back to my, my, my point that I've been saying all the time is you need to build trust and respect within the, the community that you would potentially be representing, right, through interpretation or through uh, education. Um, so again, investing up. Uh, upfront time to become familiar with and more than that perhaps even become a part of that community uh, and that that said um, have them help you develop a knowledge set um, or an understanding in ways that you can represent um, on their behalf in, in a voice that is um, native to you. I think the worst thing to do is sort of present as if you are the, you know, the knowledge holder of another person's or another people's culture uh, and language. But if you can develop your own authentic native voice about speaking about that, um, community, their values, their culture, their language. And again, that comes by building relationship and, and understanding um, that that's probably the, the best way to be able to represent um, another, another culture. And here in Hawaii, I don't know about where you all are from, but here in Hawaii, our, our Hawaiian community did community does a pretty good job at calling you out if you're not <laughs> uh, being, um, uh, you know, appear to be authentic and or appear to be using or misappropriating Hawaiian, Hawaiian knowledge. Um, so I think in order to avoid that, um, it really is about developing those relationships um, with the community that you um, are sharing about. And I, and I think there are ways to find your own native voice to speak about someone else's culture in impactful ways, in, in positively impactful ways. Can I, can I answer one well, question? Thank you so much for your really thoughtful questions. Um, Nancy. 
Can I answer one question that I thought Please. I saw somebody ask that, I, that it made me laugh because it takes me back. So the question was, how did I get a position to be a director of an astronomy center um, as a PhD student, correct? I'm still a PhD student. I've been a PhD student for some time now. <laughs> But um, actually, I became the director of Emi Law when I only had a master's, when I just graduated from my master's degree. And um, it was not welcomed by a lot. It wasn't welcomed by, in particular, the science community and even the university community who's used to PhD titles being, you know, a necessary minimum requirement. Um, but what put me in my position, I went through this arduous interview process. There was a massive committee that went through multiple interviews with me, and then they put me out to public interviews. I had, I think, three public interviews I had to go through where general public could come and ask me questions, and many took advantage of the opportunity. But at the end of the day, my Hawaiian and my local community here, those born and raised here in Hawaii, they came to bat because they're, for me, they came to bat because their concern was that this resource of an education center that should be for our community, in, of, and by our community, for our community, um, needed to be led by somebody who's of our community. Uh, uh, and the fear was that, you know, like many, I guess, normal or, or mainstream processes, you go and you get the best candidate from away and you bring them in because they've got museum or science center training or science training. Um, and, I, and I came with neither. <laughs> I came with Hawaiian language literature, Hawaiian education, um, nonprofit uh, experience. So um, I really attribute and then therefore take it as a very um, big responsibility um and privilege to be in the position i'm in because my community came on and advocated for that so thank you for that question because that's kind of been a funny um <laughs> it's kind of been a funny um issue for me because i've been confronted on that like well i i, I actually opposed your hire because it needed to be somebody from the science community with a phd and um and my response was, well, that, that'd be great. And, I, and I'm hoping that in the future, our own local kids will be the uh, PhD who run these centers. Um, so I'm sort of the inter intermediary that came in to help hopefully forge a path for more of our local and in particular our Hawaiian kids to take these kinds of roles on um, and help to lead our community. So mahalo. Well, you there have, go ahead, Marcia. There have actually been a couple of uh, really great questions that attendees have posed, and uh, if you don't mind, I've got a couple of more for you. We have time. Do you have time? You good? Okay. Um, someone has shared. Thank you for helping us by sharing your story. You said that Imiloa provides a crucial role as a convener of communication and debate during the current dispute, I imagine there might be meaningful debate within the Native Hawaiian community on the subject. Do you find that Imiloa is called on to be the convener for that internal debate? And if so, do you find that you are able to host it there without the intrusion of external voices? Yes, I, I think, um, I don't know if, you know, it's challenging navigating that within the context of Imiwa. Uh, you know, the astronomy community, or many, not all, in the astronomy community want Imiwa to come out. And, and this is particular to the TMT current issue, or just in general, the conflict between management and development on Mauna Kea. Okay, I'm going to. Uh, yep, I'm going to assume it's in that context. Um, I think you can take it for what it is, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, there are those that want Imiloa to come out with a strong um, pro-development uh, on Mauna Kea stance as it relates to um, TMT or the further development of astronomy. There are those that want Imiloa to come out with a strong opposition to further development on Mauna Kea. And um, what we've... Um, 
that, that put our staff and our stakeholders in great conversation, even internally. Like, how do we feel about that? Uh, everybody in Iniloa re represents differing opinions. I have staff that are staunch supporters of further development on Mauna Kea, and I have staff that have been arrested in opposition for development on Mauna Kea, and everybody in between. Uh, or and many different perspectives in between. And I am so proud of that, number one, because I think that shows that Imiloa truly reflects where the community is at on the issue. And it truly shows um, the integrity of our mission, which is centered right on education for our community, in particular for our youth. And, and nobody opposes that. Nobody opposes that astronomy discovery and scientific inquiry is a bad thing. Uh, but people have differing opinions on how astronomy is managed on Mauna Kea and if further development should or shouldn't occur. So Imi Law is an advocate for the continued um, partnership between scientific expertise and our Hawaiian expertise um, coming together to create educational opportunities for our kiki and that uh, our kids and so that is something that we sit squarely on. So we, and we've been criticized for this too. We haven't actually engaged um, yes or no on the development and stewardship conversation. So there's, there's that aspect to navigating and managing. But I think as a result, we've been able to, um, for the most part, this is not, you know, 100% of our community, but for the most part, I think people see Inu as a place that they can come regardless of their views of Mauna Kea's management to engage and to learn and to share. Um, and I want to keep it that way. It becomes challenging within the institutional perspective, right, for um, Imi Loa to balance, right, because the University of Hawaii institution is the one seeking development for Mauna Kea and Imi Loa is a part of that uh, institution. <laughs> so it becomes challenging um, in that way to manage perception. And I'll say perception because I think the reality is um, university leadership has been very supportive of Imi Loa and its role and what it's been able to create and maintain. Um, so from the institutional standpoint, there hasn't been, although sometimes communications, um, in working with different communications teams and marketing teams, right? Of sometimes the messaging going out is not necessarily what I, would have liked to have seen gone out. Sometimes it's more, hey, look at what the university is doing through any of those programs, and then look at the development we want to do. I, that, that's not in my um, preference list <laughs> because we're not you know, actively engaged in the management um, conversations. I, I feel a sense of responsibility, though, in that because we are part of the UH uh, university and because we are actively engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with community, we have a responsibility to represent the voices that, that um, come into our, our center and into our programs at those management decision-making conversations. And that is something I take very um, seriously in that Amy Law, um, besides our educational portfolio, we have a responsibility to share um, with decision makers because we actually are part of and have access to those decision makers, whereas maybe members from our general community don't. So we are constantly giving input into the university system um, based on what we are learning from our community through our programs. Well, I'm going to, I think we can spend just a minute more on a question, a last question. There'll be a last question for you. What are some of the persistent challenges in promoting the use of native language alongside English in science? Oh, off the top of my head, I mean, sometimes there's a desire to have like a, like a tick for tack, you know, like, oh, we're going to talk about the sun in this exhibit. So what are your folk tales about the sun. <laughs> this is not necessarily language, it's also just interpretation. Um, so the, the miscontextualizing of our story, our knowledge, and even our language to kind of fit scientific um, or 
mo uh, modern scientific um, inquiry, it, it doesn't work that way. There is no, you know, apples equals apples. It's like apples equals whales. I mean, it's like, so trying to get a, the point across that it's not um, a literal translation that we need. It's a deeper understanding that then therefore allows the articulation of that concept or that body of knowledge um, in, in, a, in a true form best represented in the different languages used. So that's one of the challenges sometimes is like, oh, well, what's your word for, oh, I don't know, you know, supernova. Well, okay, for one, we don't have a word for supernova traditionally in Hawaiian. So let's sit and talk. Let's talk. Let's learn more about what a supernova is. And I'll tell you if I can draw from our traditional language about, you know, something that is perhaps, perhaps related to a supernova. So there's that. And it takes time to do that. Most times the scientific community wants us to come up with a name or a word like, like now. Like, well, how come you, <laughs> how come you can't tell me what supernova is in Hawaiian? Well, it's not that easy. We're still trying to recover our language so that it's renormalized. So I would ask for patience and for, again, sit, talk story. Talk story is a great phrase here in Hawaii we use all the time so that we can learn um, and, and best represent our own worldviews given the, the, the questions being asked. And I, I will say that with that as being our messaging that we've been telling the scientists we work with all the time, um, it's resulted in many of them actually enrolling to take Hawaiian language. <laughs> we did a program last year where we had 111 astronom or astronomers and affiliates of astronomy um, sign up for, for, for Hawaiian language class. And um, they not only learn the mechanics of the language, but they learn context, historical references. Um, so they loved it and they keep, um, they keep begging for more but so things like that I think that it's it's they the astronomy community wants to learn and they want to be better stewards so I'm appreciative to see that progress <laughs> thank you so much Ka'iyu mahalo nui I can't tell you how grateful we are to have you have been our second speaker for this series. Your presentation has done so much to continue the tone and quality of what we are intending to share in this series. It has been an honor to host you today. And if you have been looking at any of the comments in the chat rooms as this uh, presentation has continued, <clears throat> you'll, you'll see how much people have appreciated uh, your comments and your wisdom. We are recording all of the speakers' presentations. They will be available on our Indigenous Education Institute website, which is www.indigenouseducation.org. The recordings will contain the entire PowerPoint presentations as well as the audio. To all of you who have found your way to this presentation, I want to say that my partners and I are most grateful for the investment of your time and hope we've piqued your interest. I want to extend a special thank you to our technical support, Chris Terran of Terran Solutions, Friday Harbor, Washington, and Art Ferrero and Jeff Cooper from the BLM Cater, which is Collaborative Action and Dispute Resolution Group. We will be sending out an email to you just after this presentation with a very short survey asking your reaction to what you have heard today. Please take the time to answer the questions because it is really helpful to us to inform our future program design. This is also a save the date message. Our next presenter is Robin Kimmerer, Distinguished Teaching Professor and Director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at SUNY in Syracuse, upstate New York. Robin is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. She's also the author of one of my all-time favorite books, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of the Plants. We invite you to return for Robin's talk, which will take place on August 20th. Thanks so much for your interest, and we'll see you soon. Ahiehe, hagone, 
and goodbye. <laughs>